Okay, so um, in this webinar, we're going to talk about um, techniques you use when you do large um, network processing in um, Gamut. This is uh, just the idea of this one is to essentially, again, introduce some of the tools that we use to um, do testing of the runs for Globe K, and then what happens when we start going to very large networks. And by very large, um, it varies in size, anywhere more than 100 stations, but um, something like the gauge uh, node processing is around about 1,500 stations uh, that are processed every day. So we um, uh, have techniques that we can use to look at those, and we'll talk about those at the moment. So what we're going to look at is uh, generating large gamut solutions where you have more than, say, 50 stations. And um, there's sort of two categories that we look at here. One is when you have a regional network, and that regional network may have two or 300 stations in it. And so how do you go about fitting that into the gamut uh, processing? We do that with subnetworks. Uh, and so in this case, you essentially have a list of sites or Rhinex files that are available, and you want to process all of the data that you have available. The other category is when you want to do global networks. Uh, and this is essentially where you have a list of lots of stations, maybe three or 400 stations around the world, and you want to choose a subset of those stations that allows you to generate reasonably uh, very good globally distributed networks. Uh, the second category is, for most users, something that they tend not to do. Uh, this is the approach we use when we do global uh, orbit, in a, orbit determinations uh, for the IGS, for example. And then we'll also start looking at strategies for large network processing in Globe K. And um, as many of you probably saw yesterday when we did some demonstrations, for networks which have 20, 30 stations in them uh, for a single day of data, Globe K runs just within a couple of seconds. It's not a, a um, time-consuming task. If you are combining many years' worth of data in a network that has 100 stations or something uh, of that order, uh, that will typically take you know less than an hour or so for Globe K to do 20 years' worth of combinations. However, when you start getting into large numbers of stations, several hundred stations, for example, then uh, Globe K can take a long time to run. Um, and in particular, something like the gauge uh, velocity fields that we create, uh, which uh, when you add in all the discontinuities in the um, time series, which generate new station names for every one of those, and the uh, data processing goes all the way back to 1996, um, those can take a very long time to run. And... Um, and the, and the gauge one, even with our tools where we subnet, et cetera, still take uh, about a week to generate the full uh, combinations of solutions. So when you have those very long runs that could potentially take a week or so to run, you don't want to have to re repeat them. And so what we have is what we refer to as sort of prototyping tools. And the concepts here are that things which read time series are able also to read the files that we actually use in Globe K, the, the APR files, depending precisely what we're doing, the APR coordinate files, the uh, earthquake files, et cetera, that allow us to rename sites. We can use those same files in programs like TSFIT, which does time series fitting, TSCON, which we can use in a mode in which it re-realizes the reference frame from a time series set of files. So it's we can use it to convert between reference frames or most often to take a set of time series that are in a reference frames point to point that we're not certain of and convert it all into a consistent reference frame. And it does it with time series. And so it's a much faster processing than Globe K can be done. So um, the other one is this program called GLList. We had a quick demonstration of that um, the other day, and GeoList lists the contents of your uh, uh, H files. So you give it the, the list of H files you're going to process, the GDL file, as we normally call it. And GeoList will tell you what is in those in terms of stations, what satellites have been used. It has a summary of the models that are used. And if you've come from the gamut processing, 
then those models tell you precisely what was used in gamut. And if you had many, many years worth of H files, then that will let you know whether you have, whether the models have actually changed during that uh, time that you've um, collected all of those H files. And so uh, GeoList can also read uh, the EQ files and a priori coordinate files, and it will tell you whether, it'll tell you exactly what sites you will end up with when you apply those EQ uh, renames and earthquakes, et cetera, to your time series. And that's particularly useful if you're doing Excel, you know, deleting uh, sites with the XCL or the XPS uh, options in the renames. And uh, the other one, as I said, so and TSCon, as I said, will realize your uh, reference frame. Also, if you bring in time series from other groups, such as um, JPL or uh, uh, UNR, TSCon can convert those files into uh, the standard POS file format that we use for TS, FIT, et cetera. And it does the conversion based uh, essentially on the, um, the header lines which are in the file. It does an automatic detection of what type of file you are giving it. And then, as I said, TS fit is the thing that we use to fit time series. And some of the things we can uh, generate from that is files that we can uh, do for calculating process noise and for um, uh, doing the uh, Markov processes in Globe K. So when we're doing very large Globe K runs, typically we actually do start with TS fit to tell us on our current time series exactly how well uh, everybody fits together, you know, potentially to, uh, to detect unnoticed uh, discontinuities, et cetera, in the time series. Okay, so when you're doing large uh, processing, SH gamut, as gamut itself, as we said, is limited to 99 sites because of its own internal bookkeeping uh, strategy that is used uh, in differentiating the sites, et cetera. 99 is the maximum number of sites. Generally, we try to keep the networks around about 50 stations. Um, again, the runtime in um, gamut goes as about the cube of the number of stations. So doubling from 30 to 60, for example, will have a run which is eight times longer typically. Uh, and that has to do with all the ambiguity parameters that are in the solve solution. It's the, the estimation solve strategy that is for large networks, the thing that takes the most time, inverting, creating and inverting the normal equations, and then doing the ambiguity resolution on those normal equations. Um, and so as a in general rule, it's um, faster to do small networks. We haven't for a long time explored, um, some time ago we did explore the issue if you ran two 30 station networks versus running the 60 station network, how well do the results actually agree between the two? Because they're not rigorously exactly the same thing. Um, and the times we've tested that in the past, provided the networks are um, uh, connected successfully, which again, you only really need one point to connect the networks. Um, and if you do that, then the, you get a good match between the um, individual subnetted solutions and the large solution. So in SH gamut, when you are subnetting, then the thing we normally take advantage of is the net extent option. And so for each one of the subnetworks, we give it a net extent in the sites.defaults file. We give an experiment name, which is uh, related to the network for in which a station appears. And so you will have name net one, net two, net three, et cetera. And in your sites.defaults under those individual network names, you say which sites are going to be in those networks. And then when you run uh, SH gamut, you have a net extent and it might be something like N1, N2, N3, and the day number automatically gets prepended to that. Uh, and then having done the individual subnetworks, we then combine them together in Globe K. And um, as we pointed out uh, earlier on, when you do this subnetting, it's important that when you run H to global, that you do not use the minus A option uh, if you're running um, in these subnetwork approaches, because the minus A option puts on an under, puts on a covariance matrix associated with rotation and translation 
which then becomes different for each one of your networks and your networks will be able to rotate relative to each other. Um, if you're doing this in SHG uh, or RED, there is an option that um, lets you um, uh, do this. Again, as Mike and I keep saying, uh, SHG or RED is sort of good for some very, very standard things, but any small deviation, um, and really its options can't handle it, and it's just much easier and to get a better understanding of what you're doing is to do the individual steps yourself, which really is simply the H to global run, create the GDL list, and then run globe K in the way that you want to run it. So SH, the the need for SHG or red is far less than it is with uh, SH gamut. So in the SH gamut processing, the biggest thing it does is it creates all of the files and creates all the links that you need to actually have a successful gamut run. And uh, it also sets up a lot of things like the orbit integration, the durations, et cetera. There's a lot of very fine um, nitpicky um, bookkeeping you have to do for Gamut, which is tricky if you do it manually yourself. SH Gamut sort of takes care of that. Globe K really doesn't have all those nitpicky sort of specific features and exact file names and that you need to create links for. And so it's not as needed as it is for SH Gamut. And as I said, those prototyping tools are programs like TSCon. Uh, TSSum is the program which uh, generates the POS files, and TSSpit is the time sitting uh, term. So when you run shplotpos, for example, it does create POS files. The default is actually to remove them when it's completed, but there are options to keep the POS files. And again, generally, I just run this program TSSum, which is the one which extracts. Um, uh, the time series values from an org file, and it works in a way in which the um, uh, POS files get extended as you add new data. And if you were to reread a date that you'd already processed in the past, TSSum sees whether the numbers are different or not. If they're different, it replaces the old value. If they're the same, it just keeps the old value in the file. So when you do large regional networks, we actually have a program to help you do this. You can uh, subnet manually if you wish to. Again, it's the idea is you create a sites.defaults, which has experiment names that correspond to networks, and you put in uh, the stations that you want in subnetwork. The programs that do this automatically is called NetCell. And um, the usage, and again, if you look at the help, it'll explain how to use it. But basically the usage is that you give it a minus F and then a file. And that is uh, a file which contains the list of Rhinex files that you want to process. Um, that normally that file gets created with an LS minus S. And so the minus S in an LS command means put out the size. So this style of getting the directory list has a numeric value at the front and then the file name and the numeric value is the size of the file and it's in units of blocks um, which is uh, typically 128 or 256 bytes that size is used just to make sure that if you have very small files that they don't actually get included in the processing you need to give it a, um, a velocity field file and essentially this is again just to get the site coordinates um, and this is long latitude and longitude and the site name. And then, um, so you do that for the, all of the stations you have. You can get that velocity field from, uh, if you've processed before, you can get it from a TS fit uh, run where you've estimated velocities. Uh, you can also create it from a uh, GL list uh, output, which gives, there's a part of the output that, end, that the lines end in capital P and they have the lats and the longs of the sites that are needed. And so you can, there's many ways you can create this different velocity field. Uh, so, but it basically what it's needed for is to know the name of the site and where it's located. Then minus N is the number of sites you want in each network. Um, and then the actual number that gets used will depend on how many total sites you are processing. And so it's going to choose a, a number which is um, about the value you give it, but it actually is an integer multiplier gets to the, um, the size of the net you, network you want. And the last network has a, some, has a fewer number of sites in it. 
uh, just to cover up the last bit that's remaining. And then the minus T option is the number of tie sites that you want between the networks. And that value must be greater than zero uh, for, if you're doing something like, you know, a few hundred stations, you can actually use maybe two or three tie sites between the networks. One of the interesting, nice things in Globe K is you could then, even though stations have the same um, name, in different networks, in Globe K, one of the rename options that you have is to rename a site based on the network that it is in. And so if you do have more tie sites than are needed, you can, in order Globe K, automatically rename the sites which are not uh, so that they have different names in the different networks. And then you can actually compare how close are the coordinate estimates you get for those tie sites in that combined processing. Again, this is one of those things that you can experiment with just to see uh, how much variation there is. Uh, for very large networks, um, the you want to keep this number. So for the gauge processing, when we did that with Gamut with 1, 1,500 stations, uh, networks of order 50 um, sites or so, uh, it turns out that the Thai network site actually becomes very large. And so we keep that number of Thai sites actually just to one um, per network. And that gets put into a network by itself. Uh, and then you um, can give a station.info file. And again, the defaults to using your tables uh, station.info file. The reason that's put there is just to make sure that you actually have the metadata that you need for the sites you're going to process. And then a minus C is the code, uh, two characters long, which sets uh, how the networks are going to be named. And so if you give the code of NE as given here, then your networks get NE 01, 02, 03, all the way up to NN, uh, suggesting that there is actually a, um, a limit of uh, 99 networks. Um, but if you consider 99 networks by 50 uh, stations, that's well over 5,000 stations before you hit that problem. And then finally, um, we also have a um, uh, an option in here. It's actually been there now for a decade, um, which allows you to specify the statistical characteristics of the sites. And uh, that is used um, to help uh, to control in the tie sites to make sure you use tie sites which are of high quality. Um, and that, uh, again, get, is the uh, output that comes from SH, SH Gen stats. So uh, we normally written to the script. So this output for this program just directly goes to the screen. Most of the time, you always redirect it into a file. And, uh, and as I said, if you use this minus um, RW option, then it's going to do the subnetting on the assumption that you're actually going to do globe K processing with this. And it's going to use that uh, random walk file to essentially get the the quality of the individual stations that are being used in your Globe K subnetworks. So the output that comes from this uh, is basically it tells you the name of the uh, log file where um, uh, the, the um, input of where you had your Rhinex uh, files, uh, name of the velocity field file. You can see this is dot pos, um, so it's was actually just based on positions and not velocities, how many sites were in the network, and then how many sites are being totally processed. So it's 1,358 in this case. Um, this actually, uh, yeah, so it tells you how many sites were actually aimed to be processed. So we know the position file tells us that we know about 1,300 stations. On this particular day, we have 1,200 stations available. Uh, it tells you the range of latitudes and longitudes, just to show you can get a sense of how large your network is. And then uh, for this number of stations with normally 30, 30 sites per network, um, it comes up and really has come up with 39 sites in 32 networks and then 25 sites in the one network at the end. And then uh, and the number of tie sites in this case was one. So it's each network is tied just by one station. And then it starts listing off the information about the networks and um, how they're being formed. So the way this algorithm works, and the final output of that uh, program is a sites.defaults file, 
which has for the networks with the stations that should be in the networks. And then the tie sites actually appear multiple times and in different networks. So the algorithm um, works. Uh, so it starts and finds the highest density region that you have stations. And then it selects stations from that highest density region, removes those stations from the list of stations and recomputes the density across your network. And then it chooses the next highest density region, removes those stations and continues processing that until it ends up with uh, the uh, all of the stations essentially being allocated into a particular network. And when we do this for something like the uh, gauge network, for example, it invariably starts in Southern California because that's where the highest density of sites is. And it sort of works its way along the Pacific North American boundary because there's a lot of sites in those. Uh, at some point, it will probably drop up into Alaska where there's a reasonable density of stations. And then by the time it's finishing, it's sort of taking sites from the East Coast of North America um, and uh, Midwest and other sites that are left over from those other high density regions. So each of those individual networks has no overlap between the, um, those networks at all. The final network that gets created is what we call the centroid network. And what it does is for each one of the regions, each one of those subnetwork regions, it finds the site that is closest to the center of that um, network. And uh, if you have n, if you have one tie site, it finds one site in the middle of each network, and that's what ties all the networks together. Now remember that when we combine this, the orientation of these networks is going to be the same for each one of the networks. So the tie site is only to tie translational uh, values of the sites together. That's why you have to use the minus A option in H to global to, to sort of turn off that automatic uh, rotational uh, deconstraint that's applied so that the networks don't rotate relative to each other. So, uh, and again, if you have more than, uh, if T is greater than um, uh, one, if you have two, then it chooses a site near the centroid and then it chooses the next site sort of up towards the edges of the network um, to sort of, again, sort of position itself across the network. The main output of this is actually the sites.defaults.year.day. And that's what's used in the gamut processing. And then the exp code, uh, and the next is normally set to something like NEXX and where XX is a numeric value. So generally we keep the uh, net extent and the um, code, the experiment code, uh, the same character just for ease of scripting. So the script, um, with SH gamut then gets passed to uh, the gamut uh, script that does parallel processing. And that's called um, SH PBS gamut for the portable batch system. And this particular uh, shell script, its use depends a bit on how your cluster, if you're running a big cluster, what is the um, uh, uh, scheduling system and um, job allocation system being used on that system. You might need to do some modifications for this, depending on how your parallel system is actually specifically um, set up to do the processing. And again, you don't have to do this. In theory, you, you have a set of SH gamut calls for each one of the networks, and you could manually launch those jobs onto different computers in your system. Uh, most uh, modern uh, uh, CPUs have 20 or 30 cores in them. And um, we know from the machines that we use with uh, 24 cores in them, uh, if you run 20 cores simultaneously with um, Gamut, that's each core pretty much can run the job at the same speed as, the, um, as a single job. Uh, you just worry about the disk access on your uh, machines when you're doing parallel runs like this. So that's how you would go about doing a large regional network where you want to divide it up. And again, if you have a um, hundred stations or something like that, that's probably just as easy to do it manually yourself. Uh, it's really when you have these large, so in something like Gage, it's a large number of stations and the stations that are available each day tend to vary. There's, uh, most of the stations report uh, successfully on time but there's a number of gauge stations that, um, you know, the telemetry is not great. And so they may not 
actually report in a timely fashion, get their data in. So we do see a reasonable amount of fluctuation of the available station site to day-to-day uh, to -day in the processing. Now, if you want to do global processing, uh, we have a shell, we actually have a program called Global Cell for doing the selection of the sites. Um, and because of the way this program works, we find it easier in this case to actually have a shell script that actually runs the program. And again, it does exactly the same thing. It sets up sites dots defaults for the years and days for the, you know, tagged by year and day that set the networks for that particular day. Um, this script um, either FTPs or uses um, a HTTPS um, connection to quiz the different direct different archives that you tell it what files are actually available on that day. And uh, so that'll so you specify the list of archives you want to use. And um, that's the list that we know about is in a file called sh still called sh underscore ftp underscore info. Um, that um, the name is actually these days, we don't actually use FTP for this in most cases, some archives still are, but most of them we're using a HTTPS uh, connection with um, either curl or wget. And so the standard um, shell scripts in gamut, the sh get rhinex shell script has sort of two ways that it can run. One is it can actually download Rhinex data, you give it a list of sites to use, but it also has an option to return the list of um, files that are available on a given day. And that's what we actually use, that list option. And that allows us for the archives to build up a list of all of the available sites that are around. Um, and then to sort of set up these networks you want, you need a core list. And this is um, just small four number, um, four character codes of sites to be included if they are available. And so for the IGS processing that we do, for example, we have those sites as being uh, the main IGS um, sites. And um, so if they're available, they get processed. And once we've sort of gotten all the networks are formed with the sites that are available in that list, we then go to other sites that are in the uh, FTP return that are available on that day to fill out the networks. You also need a, um, a list of reference sites for the initial sites in each network. That'll be on the next slide. And then um, the networks share tie sites with each network. And uh, essentially the algorithm used here in site selection uh, is to keep the sites as far apart as possible. So it's trying to get a global coverage so once it chooses the first site, the next site it chooses, it's gonna to try to choose one on the opposite side of the world. And once that one's chosen, the next site it's gonna choose, cho it's gonna to try to choose would be 90 degrees away somewhere in the middle. And it's gonna keep building out. And as it calculates a median length um, between the current sites in the network and the new site to, to choose the one which maximizes that number. And um, so the, uh, uh, and again, the output of, um, oh yeah, oops, sorry, that's so, oh, sorry, went the wrong direction. Yeah, so the reference site list, um, so essentially we seed each one of the networks and it's in fact this reference list that tells us how many networks we want to process. So in this example, we're, by doing six of these, we're saying that we want six networks and that each network should start with these sites if they're available. And again, all, at any one time, only one of these sites actually needs to be available. But in general, if you look at the locations of these sites, these sites are sort of tried to be split across the world. So Onsela, for example, is in Sweden. Algonquin is up in Canada. This is uh, somewhere in Caribbean. Um, this is over in Washington, why did I forgot where that one actually is? Um, maybe I'll try the next one. Uh, so this, you know, this one in here, AMC two is in the middle of the U.S. This is Matera in Italy. This is Hawaii, uh, and again, I've forgotten where that particular site is. Uh, so the idea is that these sites are just a few sites around the world. They don't, as I say, need to be absolutely available each day. And if none of them are available on the day, I think that's still okay. Uh, the code will just basically choose. Um, 
someone from the preferred list to sort of start the networks off. The main use of this is to get the, uh, the number of networks that you want to conclude, want to process. Okay, and so, uh, and again, these, uh, if you want to um, see that, that is the default name for that is the ref.net site. And, um, and if you run sh uh, select network, it's going to, again, tell you the help on how to do it. And uh, global cell will actually run, creates the sites.default file for your processing. So having sort of looked at how you might do big gamut runs, um, and if we again take, say, something like the gauge network, where you've done all those very large gamut runs, you have 1,000 stations per day, you've gone uh, many, many uh, years worth of processing, or you know, just you can also just download the Synex files from Gage from the UNF, from the um, Earthscope facility, and you could start rather than doing all the gamut processing yourself. You could start with the Synex files that are from Get from the Gage facility if you want to start doing some large processing yourself. Um, and again, for global stuff, you could do the same for downloading the global files from uh, MIT, or you could go to the IGS CDDIS site download Synex files for all of the um, different analysis centers that contribute to the IGS. So, so to get the inputs for Globe K to do these large processings, you can either run gamut yourself, which will take a long time, or you can download the Synex files that have been generated by other processing centers to use those. So when you want to start doing these large combinations, there's actually, a, as I said, what we often call prototyping tools that essentially allow you to test whether your solution is going to work or not. And there is two main programs we use, TSCon, uh, and that converts a variety of formats into the PBO POS file format. Um, and most importantly, it allows your new reference frame to be realized using the same techniques as used in GLORG. And uh, although, again, the time series files themselves, the sigmas in the time series files are usually um, small because they've come from a geolog run of some type. And uh, what the program TSCon does is it actually re-rotates and translates the files. Uh, in this case, it is truly calculating a rotation and translation. So with TSCon, baseline lengths are actually preserved if you're not doing a scale uh, estimation. Whereas in geolog, Baseline lengths are preserved if the system is free to translate and rotate as a um, in the way. If it's got some constraint on those other quantities, it will uh, change the baseline lengths. So TSCon, so the idea would be if you have a list of um, stabilization sites that you want to use and you want to see how well you're going to be able to realize the reference frame from those sites as a function of time or how well each one of those sites actually fits within your reference frame, you can use TSCon to test out that choice of reference frame stations. And its output will tell you which ones it actually will throw away because they're not consistent uh, in the time series on a given day. And then TSFit is the way we can do uh, fitting. And again, since TSFit operates on single sites at a time, uh, it is much faster than running in Globe K, but it will also take the Globe K earthquake files and that allows you to tell whether the discontinuities that you're putting into the uh, earthquake file, and when you process the time series with TSFIT, do those discontinuities actually correspond to when there's discontinuities in the data? And have you caught all of the possible discontinuities? Could there be a discontinuity that you have missed, which means that the TSFIT will give you an anomalous looking velocity possibly, but also then a large RMS as well. And so the TSFIT program, since it can read these EQ files, essentially allows you to tell whether the way you plan processing your data, whether there's going to be any large discontinuities that you have not detected uh, beforehand that could corrupt the solution. The other thing you can do with TSFIT is the SHGen stats uh, run, which runs on the summary file generated by TSFIT. And when you use the... Uh, uh, the real sig the uh, realistic sigma option, then it generates the process noise that you can use in Globe K. 
It also generates a recommended set of sites to use as the frame realization sites. And you can use that list back in TSCon to see how well that TSCon list will work at each uh, day where you have data, uh, the frame is transformed and it will tell you what the RMS spit was to the frame realization. And so you can look down that again, things like sort uh, on the column in the outputs allows you to go from the smallest to the largest RMSs to sort of detect whether there's places where you have problems in the RMS or not. Uh, the program's TSSum is the one that actually extracts uh, and appends time series from GlobeK or GLORG output files. And so generally these get incremented. So if you're processing uh, daily, for example, and you have a separate org file for each one of the days, then as new org files are created with new days, you just have to include those new org files in TSSum. And again, it has a directory. You, the app first argument is the directory where all the files are it's going to check whether you already have a time series file for that particular site. And then it will read the new data and it will append the new data or intersperse it with the old data. If there's um, missing data in the original time series files, it will create a consistent time series file uh, just using the news data pretended up, pre, uh, appended onto the uh, existing uh, previous file. So again, the prototyping concepts we're using here is that you want to make sure that the earthquake file you're using has all of the discontinuities that are going to affect your results and that your list of stabilization sites that are used for the velocity and time series analyses are a good list of sites um, for the a priori uh, coordinates that you have. And, uh, and again, TS fit when you run it, will generate a priori coordinate files uh, for both use in TSCon and in um, GlobeK and GeoRed. In fact, these days, the APR coordinate files that we use are generally from TSFIT itself rather than from GlobeK. Uh, basically, TSFIT is very good at looking at all the discontinuity names you have and things like the extended entries it makes sure that you have the extended entries for all the different names of the individual sites that might exist because of discontinuities and earthquakes. Um, GLList, as I said, can be used with the EQ file um, and uh, the use site commands uh, to get, a, so the use site commands that are in, we didn't talk about this, but in the GlobeK command files, uh, you can actually specify which sites from the um, list of H files, the sites that are in your H files, you can specify which sites to actually use. And uh, that could be a case, for example, um, in our Antarctic processing, for example, Antarctica, some of the sites are actually sitting on ice. And so they are moving by 100 meters per year and they are potentially quite irregular. If we're creating an Antarctic, Antarctica uh, velocity field, we don't want to use those sites in that velocity field combination because the uh, we could put a very large Markov process noise on them, but uh, they really aren't secular velocity sites. And so we'll use this use site command in GLOBE-K has uh, sort of two ways it can be used. It can be used to add a site or it can be used to remove a site. So by default in GLOBE-K, all of the sites that it finds will be used. And then you can have use site and then space and then minus, and then a name of a station, and that will remove it. And you can put multiple stations on uh, the same line, or you can use the command multiple times. And so by the minus, you will take it out of the solution. You can also go the other direction. Sometimes when you have these large, um, something like the PBO network with, uh, if you downloaded the um, uh, Sinex files from the Earthscope site, you may be interested, I know some of our participants here are just interested in volcanoes. Uh, you might be interested just in the Akatan volcano region. So you can download those sites and then you can say use site clear, which removes all the sites being used. And then you could add the list of sites that are on and around the volcano so that your run would only use that local group of stations. Um, there's also a, a version of this, which is the use pause uh, com command, it has the same uh, plus or minus type syntax. 
And in the use post command, you can give it a latitude and longitude bounding box, and it will either use sites only in that box, or you can tell it to not use any sites in that box, depending on which way you want to go. So when you, uh, between the EQ file and these use uh, site lists, um, GeoList can be used to tell you exactly what sites you're going to end up with in Globe K uh, when you run this in a Globe K solution. Uh, and TSCon, TSSpit, as I said, can read all of the standard Globe K earthquake and a priori coordinate files including the extended entries. And, um, and so again, they basically allow you from the time series to see what's going to happen when you try to do the estimates. And, you know, in TS fit, do you have the right discontinuities in the time series? Um, what is the best uh, post-seismic model to use? Does a logarithmic work better? Does an exponential model work better? Uh, I will say uh, that in both the exponential and the log models, um, you estimate the amplitudes of those terms and you specify a priori the time constant. In the gamut software itself or the Globe K, we don't have the non-linear estimation of the time constant for those earthquake files. That you have to play around with. Uh, generally, something like TS View is a good place to, to look and see what would be an appropriate time constant. Um, and again, since these programs don't manipulate the whole covariance matrix between all the different sites, um, they are um, very fast, and they also assume that the uh, time series have been stabilized by something originally so that the sigmas on the sites are reasonable numbers. I think actually, even if that doesn't happen, it's, um, it still works fine. It's just that uh, it has trouble differentiating between high quality and low quality sites because everybody's sigma tends to be the same in these uh, frames that have not been uh, realized. So if you're going to do one of this, the first general um, strategy for doing this processing is you, you have all of, you say, your Sinex files from um, Earthscope. You convert them into binary H files using H to global. You generate a list of all the files that you have that you have created. That might be you know, three or 4,000 uh, individual binary H files. And then generally, uh, you'd run GeoRed first. And you would run it um, typically using, say, the HRF 2004 uh, 14 uh, sites for the stabilization, the standard tables that we distribute. Because again, something like the gauge network has um, 20 or 30 IGS sites embedded in its list of sites. Um, and so you would generate that to generate time series. And then uh, from that, you could generate a velocity solution and then you could look at um, the, uh, the sites that are good in that and uh, use those to get the stabilization uh, sites for the GL run. And as you can see, there's a bit of a catch-22 here in that um, you need to know which sites are well behaved for generating the time series. And then, um, but you don't really know what's the best behaved sites until you've generated the time series. And so what we tend to do, as I said, it's, we've had good success with just using the IGS sites initially, generate time series, and then look with the SHGen stats statistics, which of those sites are good, and then extend the list of sites that we're going to use to do the frame stabilization based on that. And, um, and that seems to work out quite well. So once you've got that initial um, uh, time series uh, generated, you can use TSCon to uh, test how well that time series is going to be able to be rotated or restabilized using a set of reference frames, using different a priori coordinates and uh, different stabilization sites. And then uh, again, once those are carried out, you can use TS fit to estimate new coordinates. And then you can um, add any additional parameters such as seasonal motions, earthquake, post seismic, et cetera, and jumps in time series due to uh, uh, processing. So once you've got the time series reasonably well under control using TS fit, um, you can uh, again then use SH Gen stats uh, with there's a minus TS option to show that it's um, uh, comes from the TS fit, and then uh, you can then do removal of outliers signals using an n standard deviation type criterion that uh, again the files get generated by TS fit 
They are in a standard earthquake file format. They create XPS uh, lines, which will be um, then uh, applied and not used in the gamut processing. So that handles the case of where you have a couple of bad outlier stations that you can see in the time series, and you basically have individual lines in the uh, earthquake file that remove those bad outlier sites from the globe K run. And then again, using that TS fit, you can redo the stabilization. Uh, you again, you might be looking at something in a regional area and you just want to have a local reference frame. And then again, you can iterate that to do TS fit. And then once all of the time series being generated uh, and TS fit is fitting all of the data very nicely, you've got an earthquake file that tells you where all the discontinuities is. And you have an APR coordinate file that actually is good representation of what the site coordinates are. And that's when you can then go into Globe K to generate um, the final solution in Globe K. Now, the reason you finally want to do that Globe K solution is that all of the TS fit commands exits here are working in the reference frame that was used to create the time series originally. And while we can float that reference, move, manipulate that reference frame a little, fundamentally, uh, it is still the original reference frame that came from our a priori coordinates. When we run globe K, we generate a system in which it is free to rotate and translate as it wishes to both in velocity and position. And so we can create a whole brand new reference frame that is fully consistent with the um, that with the times with the uh, globe K binary H files. And then from that reference frame, we can go back and generate new time series positions. So for the gauge network, for example, we want a North America fixed reference frame. And so we base that on a set of stations that are spread across North America and Alaska. And uh, so we re-realize that frame from the globe K solution. And as, and, uh, again, this is discussed in the um, reviews of geophysics paper. And then each year we do this again with all the next year's worth of data. And on the net, on the gate, no, sorry, on the uh, Earthscope uh, website under the gauge uh, documentation, there is reports on the, the how the velocity determination worked. How well does it compare year to year as we add more and more data? So once you've finished sort of that TS fit, um, TS con process, the earthquake file, as I said, should contain the things which have the renames for the minus XPS names. Um, and again, these files for the Earthscope processing, we actually send to Earthscope and they get posted on the uh, Earthscope website. And so there is a files, which is uh, all underscore noda underscore edits. Uh, dot eq and that is all of the edits uh, that we've actually applied for the 30 odd years worth of data that we actually have in the time series at the moment and it has all the extended entries in it and we as i said we should have a refined list of um, sites from sh gen stats and uh, that sh gen stats uh, output for the list there is a uh, an option that you can supply which essentially says how far a how far apart in um, angular distance do you want the sites to be in your reference frame list? And then it will generate hierarchical lists on a grid based on that spacing. And then the first one in the list is the best site in that grid cell. And then in terms of the lowest um, uh, random walk correlated noise of the site. And then the second one is the second best one in that cell. So each cell had maybe has up to 10 stations in it. Uh, which are in a list. And then we use that hierarchical list to basically balance the uh, reference frame uh, determination. And the reason we do that is if we were to simply base the reference frame stations on who is the smallest correlated noise sites in our network, uh, we would get dominated by sites that are in the Mojave Desert and the Great Basin of the United States where there's very little vegetation the water vapor is very low. Those sites are some of the best RMS sites in we have anywhere in the world. Um, some of those best sites for 15 years worth of data can have you know, 0.6 millimeters RMS scatter in the horizontal components, for example. And so if we were just basing it on who's got the least correlated noise, we would get very dominated by a certain part of uh, North America. 
And with this algorithm where we have a grid and we choose sites from within the grid, it allows the whole frame realization to be spread across the whole network. Uh, and so that's what, and that's an option in SHGen stats. Again, if you do the help, it'll it'll tell you how to do that. The earthquake uh, a priori quantities can be read in, and then the final globe K in GNS and runs should run with no major problems at that stage. Okay, so we've talked a lot about TS fit, um, and um, so it has lots of options. So it basically fits the PBO time series format. And again, this particular format is meant to have every sort of representation of a position you can think of. Um, it has XYZ coordinates. It has geodetic lats and longs in the WGS84 ellipsoid. Uh, and then it has, um, uh, in for the northeast and up components, uh, offsets from a reference coordinate, which is actually given in the header of the file. And this definitely replaces the old software called EN Summon Multibase, uh, which we really don't use at all anymore. One of the big problems with these is that they, uh, the files they generate, you have to generate all of the files at once, um, and they generate individual files for each northeast and up component, and they don't have as much bookkeeping information as the um, POS files do. So we output um, the prototyping tools, and so when you run TS Fit, you can give it an EQ file as an input, and then you can also have as an output an output APR file and then a report edits option, which outputs. And so the TS fit command uh, line looks like uh, TS fit and the name of the command file that's going to be run, that's going to be read, the name of a summary file. Um, and then generally, we often base the names of these other files on the beginning of the summary. We generally call these .sum files. And then just a list of the time series files that you want to uh, process. Uh, or, uh, in theory, you can also give it a file which contains the list. Um, we haven't had this problem yet, but when you do these run strings in Unix, there is a finite length that the run can run string can be. And if you have lots and lots of files, you potentially truncate that list because it runs out of a buffer that's built into the Unix system. I think that buffer is relatively short at about 32,000 characters. So when you have lots and lots of files, sometimes it's better to put the list into a file and then just give it the name of the file. So some of the TS fit uh, commands that we have are um, uh, uh, the EQ file is the name of a standard globe K EQ file. And you can give this command multiple times. Uh, we actually often do that. Uh, so for the, again, the Earthscope processing, if you look at the earthquake files we have, we have a nota all for earthquakes. We have another one for antennas that have been changed. We have another one for unknown discontinuities in the time series. And we have another one for the edits that get applied. So we have four separate files. And for bookkeeping, that's a useful way to keep them separated so we know what actually is in each one. You can output the APR coordinate file and that and generates extended entries that are used by Globe-K for when you're estimating periodic terms and exponentials and log terms, et cetera. And again, you can have a report edit um, command, which you give it a file, and it generates a, uh, a rename file that has the XPS lines in it to remove the sites on those particular day. The real sigma implements the, uh, that's the realistic sigma that implements the um, FogMex algorithm. And uh, that can be um, applied to uh, generate sigmas that account for temporal correlation in the data. And again, the Floyd and Herring uh, 2020 paper talks about how well, that, about the that algorithm and its performance relative to some of the more longer running uh, things like Hector, for example, which um, can take considerably longer to generate those results because of their flexibility with their, multiple, their uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, you can also have periodic things which allow you to put in sine and cosine estimates um, and then the period is given in days, again, 365.25 uh, for a year, and then half of that for semi-annual, et cetera. Uh, there is possible to, each one of the sites generates its own little summary file that tells you um, the statistics of the fits, velocities, periodic terms, et cetera, and any edits that's done. That's controlled by a uh, character string put at the front. Uh, the default for that is uh, TS. You can also use none 
as the option here for the name. And if you do that, none of those um, uh, summary file, no individual station dependent files get generated. Uh, you can set up, generate a globe k velocity field file, which you can then plot with shplotvel or use in velview or use in programs like velrot, for example, to rotate it into different forms. And then there's an n sigma command that allows you to um, uh, edit data based on it being n times the RMS scatter of the time series um, to remove outlier data points. The final names, as within globe K, you can use this at symbol in the name. And uh, what that does is it replaces whatever the name of the summary file is. It uh, takes the beginning name of that without the extent on it and uses that app gets replaced by that name. And uh, generally with something like uh, EQ, you might have splat.eq. Uh, and that will take the summary file name, take off the dot sum and generate a file name, which has that with dot EQ added on the end. That's the same in Globe K um, wildcard features. There's lots of other sort of little features that you can use in here in TS fit. Uh, there's a max sigma command. Uh, again, often this is targeted on um, when uh, you just have lots of data and you want to be able to do something which does a, a reasonably good job of getting through all of the data without too much manual interaction with it. Uh, so the max sigma basically excludes data which has sigmas which are too large in it. By default, that's 10 centimeters. And again, most of our time series, we have millimeter level uncertainty, so 10 is quite large. You can specify a time range over which uh, you want to do the fits. Um, you can output uh, the earthquake information for um, physical earthquakes. And then it has a, a root for the file name because each one of the earthquakes has its own code. And then uh, you can specify an offset at the time for the post seismic deformation. At what point, how many days after the earthquake do you want to see what the post seismic contribution was to the position? And those get output in a vel file type format, which can then be plotted in shplot rev, a uh, plot uh, vel. Um, and again, yeah, if you include the updates, it tells you the total post seismic accumulated uh, moment after the earthquake. Okay, so T, and again, there's an extensive fit uh, help on TS fit. Uh, when you, if you just type the name, it'll tell you everything, all the different commands. And there's more commands than I've just spoken about. Okay, so TSCon converts time series files. It'll take, it knows about formats that come from the NASA Reasons program, but the JPL formats, the SIO formats, which are XYZ files. There is a, uh, used, well, used to be Southern California Earthquake Center, now it's the Statewide California Center. Uh, CSV format, comma separated format, it can read. And then the UNR formats, and those tend to be in um, uh, Northeast Up uh, components which then get converted into Car Cartesian coordinates. And those formats can be used to convert into the PBO time series format. And uh, as I said, you can, at the same time as the conversion, you can rotate and translate the time series uh, values at each epoch to align to a new reference frame. And so we often do that with say the, the uh, JPL files, which are in this global no net rotation frame. When we want to compare to the gauge results, we will rotate those results into a North America fixed frame based on the sites that we use to realize the North America fixed frame. This program does assume that the time series positions are separated regularly by one day intervals. Um, we've not had a problem with that yet because that is the standard um, processing uh, mode, but that's how it works out when things are going to occur. Um, if you, uh, you can give it a command file, uh, if you don't give it a command file, then um, it just simply converts the files um, and changes the format. So again, the way this is run is it's tscon, the directory where you want the products to go to, the product ID that you want, and then the command file. And then the command file, as I said, is the one which would actually control whether um, uh, the frame, the sites get transformed into a new reference frame or not. And if you don't give it a command file, it will simply convert the files into the, uh, the PBO format and then a list of the files that you want to convert. And again, it knows uh, things about the names and the formats of these files. So it does automatic uh, detection of the type of file. 
So again, tscon has uh, many commands that are available. So there's, again, earthquake file. Uh, again, this is for the frame realization to make sure that on a given day, it has the correct coordinates accounting for the fact of the earthquake. Uh, the APR coordinate file tells it uh, which sites there. And again, both of these may be issued multiple times. If there's duplication, say in a site uh, name, the newer version replaces the old version. There's the stab site uh, list. And again, it can be a hierarchical list, the same as in Globe K. And again, it can be issued multiple times and the sites just get added up. And then much the same way as GLorg, you can tell it what you want to transform, uh, translations, rotation, and optionally scale. Uh, you can tell it how many iterations and then uh, the site relative weight and the N sigma. Again, this is the outlier detection. The iterations again is needed if you are actually throwing out sites at each uh, time. And again, there's sort of minimum standard deviations, the stab min command, which is in GLorg, which says that a site has to be better than a certain RMS for it to, or certain standard deviation for it to be used. And again, it's the same height covariance. So if you wanted to, uh, we were talking about, you know, downweighting the heights in doing the transformation, that is useful uh, because the height tends to be where all the loading signals are, where the a priori coordinate doesn't actually match the height because the site physically has been deformed. This height conditioned weight where you sign the variance of that. Um, TSCon is a good place for you to play around to see what is the impact as you transform between different reference frames of changing the weight that is assigned to individual heights. And again, you can specify a time range if you only want to look at data over a certain time. And the idea of these commands is they mimic the GLorg equivalent command. And, um, and again, the TSCon um, and we'll run much, much faster. And there's going to be small differences between what TSCon comes up with and what GLorg comes up with, simply because GLorg still is dealing with full variance covariance matrices, uh, whereas TSCon, you've already started for something that has realized the reference frame. Now we can give some very quick uh, examples of how these things compare with each other. So this is uh, part of the globe key solution. Um, the uh, file one here. So this is out of TS, um, uh, a Bellevue, uh, just clipped off. And so file one is from Globe K. That's the one that's in blue. And the one from TS Fit is in red. And uh, this is for data from um, 1995. That's over about 20 years worth of data. And the Globe K was a subnetted uh, solution with one per day, one uh, day per week. So it's, again, only one seventh of the data was actually used in Globe K to do this. And TS fit is based on time series. And we've used the same process noise models associated with each. And you can get a sense that these actually match each other uh, extremely well. The length here, this is a five millimeter per year vector. So these vectors are all only about two or three millimeters per year. And the blue and the red curves are almost in uh, points almost indistinguishable from each other. There are some differences in the error bars. Um, and again, part of the reason for that is that Globe K actually has a minimum random walk statistic it will apply. And uh, one of the things we've noticed is that for these types of regions, which is um, in the uh, Great Basin, the data quality is so high that that minimum random walk number that we actually use in Globe K limits the size of the error um, ellipses uh, because we've hit that bottom threshold. And that's one of the reasons the uh, error bars look better for some of the really good sites in here with the TS fit time series fitting. But the sites which aren't so good, so these ones over here, the PS124, you'll notice that the error ellipses um, structured north-south. You'll see the blue and the uh, red error ellipses there are actually quite consistent um, in size uh, for the sites where we haven't probably hit that minimum so we can take that pair of fields. And one of the nice things in uh, GLorg, is, I mean, sorry, in Bellevue is we can uh, relate each field um, and rotate each field onto itself. And these are the sort of statistics when we do that across that region. Now you see actually there is no difference in the vectors practically. And that's because uh, we've put on um, a, a small northeast and up translational motion and mostly it's about 0.6 millimeters per year in the vertical, 0.1 in the north. 
And then the RMS, once we've done that, is down at 40 microns per year, 60 microns per year, and 0.25 millimeters per year in the height. And so we can also uh, do various ways of aligning uh, statistics when we do this. So uh, this is the globe K solution uh, aligned with the weighted least squares fit uh, from TS fit. And again, the RMSs are again down at around about 0.04. Um, That's very similar to what we just saw in the um, uh, Velvue output there. And when we do it with uh, the common filter feature in TS fit, then again, the RMS differences are very, very similar between them, uh, and the mean values are very similar. And we can look at individual um, stations just to get a sense of you know, what this actually looks like in real stations. So you can see here the east velocity, uh, they, they're only differing in the um, uh, essentially the tenth of a, less than a tenth of a millimeter per year range. We get more fluctuation in the vertical, and that's possibly because of the uh, the way the height uh, sigma uh, reacts in the vertical motion. And again, vertical always tends to be at least a factor of three times worse than horizontal. And I think Mike was explaining this morning with atmospheric stuff that, that asymmetry in the atmosphere between seeing all the way around in the northeast direction versus only seeing the upper hemisphere makes the height always be a little more uncertainty. So when you want to end up doing uh, the globe K solutions, the big ones we generate, um, I meant the, the uh, gauge velocity solutions right now, the final solutions, in fact, involve over 32,000 um, parameters. Um, I know some of my uh, mathem mathematician friends have heart attacks when they realize we're running um, common filters with um, state vectors that have over 32,000 elements in them. Um, there, you always worry with common filters about numerical stability problems. And uh, that's some of the cautions that we have in terms of make, don't, making, don't make the a priori uncertainties too big, um, because if you do, you will end up with numerical problems. And so, um, so we do have a lot of that. And the, uh, so to run them, again, you want a good a priori coordinate and velocity file so that, because uh, Globe K will actually check as the H files are read in to see whether the file that it's just read, whether the values are consistent with what it's expecting them to be for individual stations. And for individual stations, if there seems to be a, uh, a, a discord between those, which can happen say with survey mode um, processing where the survey site is actually not where you think it's supposed, it was not put on the right mark, it was put on a recovery mark. Those are very classic examples of what happens. Uh, we certainly have had problems with four character um, codes differing. So uh, in some of your files, the four character code refers to one location, but in other files, it's a completely different place in some other part of the world. Um, that's what Globe K is going to be able to detect automatically. And the better the a priori coordinate files are, the easier it is for that to happen. You need the earthquake file to tell you when there's earthquakes, when there's discontinuities, and when you may have misnamed stations that could affect the solution. And again, uh, particularly when you're doing campaign uh, style processing, sometimes people get confused and they actually have two different names for the same station processed in different years, particularly if you're working in a large group where there's different people processing data. So the earthquake file can actually reconcile and bring those names back together. And then finally, you want the process noise characteristics of the site. And that's critical for getting the realistic standard deviations of the sites. And again, that's a good test in TS uh, fit that you can do. You can run TS fit in um, the just as a weighted least squares and then run it with the Kalman filter. When you run it in the Kalman filter node, the process noise is uh, appropriately accounted for in the um, time series. And they will have slightly different velocity estimates. But the biggest thing you will see is the sigmas vary dramatically between a system in which you assume it is white noise versus one in which you actually have uh, process noise applied. So if you set them up very carefully um, and make sure all the corrections, um, it should go through. Again, Globe K, if it finds a H file which is inconsistent with a, uh, has a large chi-squared increment, it will not use it to make sure that the, um, uh, it doesn't corrupt the solution. So when you do a big velocity solution, it's always good to use the, uh, GLDF output option, which is the uh, uh, GDL list option. 
and it will tell you whether the site, whether it was used or not in the solution. Uh, the log file generated by Cloud K also tells you that, but this, if you do with that option, it's actually in your output file, you know. And so you, again, typically want to define core set of you know, two, 20 to 200 sites. Um, you, as I said, with that use uh, site command, even though you have very, very large files and many, many stations, you can run Globe K where you just select just some of those sites from there. That happens very fast. Uh, even though the original H files are very large, they because they're binary, they read very fast and it doesn't take very long to actually process a small network from within that. Uh, so you can have your couple of hundred stations that you really think are good. You can generate time series. And from the time series, then uh, you can run GL Red to bring everybody else in your solutions into that same reference frame. And then uh, you can keep repeating that uh, as more and more sites and get larger and larger solutions where you're including everybody uh, in the solution. And again, so some of the other strategies that you can use to increase speed uh, you can pre-combine solutions, say from daily into weekly or monthly solutions. Uh, again, these days we tend not to do this uh, primarily because if we do just simple one day per week, uh, the result is very not very different from if we actually combine all days of the week together. When you combine the days of the weeks together, there is a square root of n reduction in sigma. So when you run globe K with weekly solution, the chi-squared increments tend to be bigger because the solutions actually weekly are not matching any better than the dailies, but their sigmas are smaller because they've been combined together. Uh, it does run much faster. Um, you just have to be a little careful of numerical rounding errors when they're used. And there is an output option in Globe K called mid to P. And so when you combine a one month's worth of data together, by default, the reference epic for that month is the last day of the week. Uh, but you can specify an option where the reference day becomes the middle of the um, of the week, just to have it more representative of when that data actually represents. Uh, there is some subtlety with the random walk process noise models. Um, again, typically, it's most important when you actually combine the final things together to get that correct. Um, there is, again, statistically some issues with the random walk within a month, if you're doing a monthly solution, the random walk contribution within the month versus the month to month variation. And um, so again, we find these days running decimated solutions is actually just as, it seems to generate a very, very similar result and it seems to work fine. And uh, we do it, you know, say once per week as uh, care. Uh, and so, so just in summary, uh, again, large network processing, net cell, remember that if you want to process more than 100 stations in gamut, and you want to have automatic uh, network generation, NetCell is the program you use. If you want to do global processing uh, to do some large tectonic process, for example, um, then the um, SH network cell, which uses the program global cell, is the way you divide that apart. And when you are doing large processing, it's good to um, prototype the solution using the time series before you start going through all the large binary uh, H files. Um, and then things like the TSView and VELVIEW in MATLAB, those are interactive solutions. Um, and then we have also this program VELROT, which easily allows you to rotate velocity fields and compare them to see how well they match each other. Some of the statistics that we were generating for this talk were generated uh, by VELROT. Okay, so that's it for large, um, uh, processing and some of the again these tools you can use them on small processing as well uh, they um, uh, you know they have a lot of flexibility in letting you analyze and look at your data and I will stop there okay did we have questions nope oh, no open questions <laughs> we have six yeah, answers yeah yeah no, we had a lot going on. Um, there was, uh, yeah, there was uh, a few questions, most of which I've answered uh, um, in text on the Q and A. Um, yeah. But there was a lot going on in the Slack at the same time as well. People just uh, generally asking questions uh, regarding what they're actually practicing with right now, uh, as well as uh, things associated with the the lecture. So. As a bit of both, I was going between the two and hopefully covered everything. But uh, as I say, just review 
um, the answers to the questions. See if you've got anything else to add, maybe. Uh, uh, were they coming? Oh, Slack was coming through the demos page. Yeah, mostly the demos, I think. Yeah. Oh, I see someone's actually drawing. Uh, okay, I'm going to do through these ones first. Um, do, 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 I think uh, Amir just put his hand up as well. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, we're in the um, we webinar. Have live, so we, I think you can give permission for Amir to talk, right? Uh, we can. Yeah. If if you want to. The hand's gone down now, so I'm not quite sure if it was accidental or... Okay. Oh, yeah. There he is. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I just need him. Uh -huh. where he can talk now just as a yes. yeah okay. thank you so um, can we, can we use the same strategy for for sub networking when when we have two different networks imagine so we have a network in asia or let's say an arabia plate we have a network and then there is another network later we come to another network in africa now we want to connect them. So can we treat them as two different subnetworks, like in, in su like subnetworking a, a large network? Yeah, you you certainly could process the African. What you want to do again is you know, for the African network, make sure you have six or so IGS stations that are distributed outside of the network and ideally all the way around the network, and then for your other network, the same sort of concept, and you want to have those IGS stations overlap um, with each other. So the, um, yeah, so when you run, uh, yeah, when you run in baseline mode, the orientation of the networks is fixed relative to the orbits. And since you're sharing an orbit, um, if you want to put those subnetworks together, on the same day, then you, again, just don't use the minus A option in use, sorry, use the um, minus A option in H to global to stop it doing the sort of automatic derotate. But uh, yeah, what you try to do is create an external network that covers both of those networks and um, you include those stations in the processing of both networks and that allows you then to tie them all together. Right, and then to tie, then ideally we need one tie point per pair of networks, right? Um, yeah, it's um, yeah. There's no real hard answer to this question. Um, idea, the minimum you need is one, <laughs> um, and if that station is a very high quality station generating really good data, that is perfectly um, fine. Um, but to be safe we often include more than one. And as I said, if you wanted to test, you can, um, in the EQ files, if you read the full help on them, there is an option to have the EQ only applied for H files, which have certain characters in their name. And so right. if, you, if you're if you running a network, which was uh, something which was Africa, had. ARF in its name and something else which had, say, um, uh, Asia in its name, you could actually tell GlobeK to rename the site from the African network to something different. And then you will have right. two sites that are physically the same, but they have different coordinates in the final. And you can compare them together to see how well they match. Right. We use them as like checkpoints. Or something. Yeah, like a checkpoint. Exactly. Right. OK, thank you. I, I would also, as I said, it is safer to have more tie points than necessary um, because if you have more, then you can always use that technique to get rid of them. But if you haven't included them in the first place um, and something goes wrong with the, uh, you know, we certainly have stations where the the, the uh, radio frequency interference, we've had stations where uh, there's been a radar that's operating nearby and whenever the radar is operating, the station just generates junk data and you have no control over it. So if you're only using right. one station, that can be problematic. Yeah, so we have, in fact, more than one. So I don't know, five, six or seven, seven. That's a guess. But 
I remember from one of the last lectures, like maybe that was in 22, that you or Mike mentioned that having many tie points that artificially increases the weight of that station. Yeah, the, yeah, you're right. Um, I have to think about the. We actually have a. Um, we have implemented a feature <laughs> which um, downweights the multiple use of a time station. Uh, uh, okay, okay. And I know. I'm actually having the name of the feature. Yeah. It's B A L N. I'm sorry. Balance. Oh. And that is an output. It's an output option, right? As I remember, it's an a uh, GL org output option. Yeah. Yeah, and it, when mm -hmm. it writes out the binary H file, yeah, B A L N balances. Yeah, yeah. So it sort of mm -hmm. helps alleviate that problem. Yeah. Okay. So that eases them. Then we can use um, several type points. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Something in chat. So we've got about five minutes left in this session before we're due for our break. So if there are any more questions or anything that anyone wants to uh, talk about while we're in the webinar, that is okay. Uh, otherwise, um, we can sign off a few minutes early and take five extra minutes for our next short break. Okay. Mm -hmm. Certainly use it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, we'll see you all at. Um, okay. Uh, well, we'll, we'll uh, yeah, we'll come back at uh, forty-five then, uh, with the uh, invited interactive session. Okay. Thank see you, everyone. You. Bye.